Hello, welcome to RUSI in London and to this webinar on a changing Middle East and the implications for NATO. My name is Neil Melvin and I'm the Director of International Security Studies here at RUSI. This event is being done in partnership with the NATO Defence College. I'd like to express my uh, uh, my support for, for their, um, my, um, my, uh, my best wishes for their support and to my colleague Thierry Tardy. Uh, the Middle East is back in the headlines for many of the wrong reasons and of course for many it's never gone away but in terms of a strategic debate the Middle East and its challenges has often dropped off the international agenda as countries have looked to pivot to different regions and to different issues in recent years. Nevertheless, the, the crisis in, in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen, and the unresolved issues around the Iranian nuclear program have remained key ones for international security, and indeed for, for NATO and the wider transatlantic community. So I'm therefore delighted that we have an opportunity today to revisit some of these questions at a key moment for NATO when it's looking about uh, its uh, new strategic doctrine and about renewing the, the organization ahead of the, the 2030 agenda, but also at a time when the Middle East itself is facing many key challenges. Uh, these include, of course, the internal difficulties and conflicts which may remain unresolved as, as we see today, but also the shifting geostrategic significance of the region uh, as the Middle East becomes not just about the, being to the south of NATO, but also being uh, an entryway to the Indo-Pacific for the transatlantic community. And lastly, of course, we see a big debate going forward about how the transatlantic community can engage in conflicts, stabilization and conflict prevention after the experience of Afghanistan, uh, Iraq and Libya, and the ways that this might be appropriate to engage in the Middle East. So I'm delighted that we have a, a great panel for today's discussion. And also that our, our very own Anise uh, will, will be, um, Tabrisi will be chairing today's event for us and uh, uh, heading the MENA program at RUSI. But now I perhaps can pass to Thierry Tadi. Well, many thanks, uh, dear Neil. And let me first say that it is uh, also a pleasure for the NATO Defense College and myself to cooperate with uh, RUSI on this event, with you, Neil, but also with Anise Tabrisi, who is in addition to her affiliation with RUSI, a non-resident associate fellow with the NATO Defense College. And I'm also happy to report that next month, we will do two more events with RUSI on the 4th of June. First, um, an event that would bring together the NDC, RUSI, and the Mediterranean Foundation of Strategic Studies with Pierre Razou, who is with us today. And this will be under the lead of the Mediterranean Foundation and will deal with the Sahel. And the other event on the 17th of June, once again with Anise on Afghanistan, the consequences of the US and NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan on the region. And this event on the 17th of June will present an NDC research paper that is co-edited by Anise. So today's event is on the Middle East, current evolutions, implications for NATO. It's usually appropriate to introduce an event uh, by saying how timely it is, uh, but this sentence is probably appropriate here. First, given what has happened in the Middle East over the last decade, but also over the last week. Um, second, given the nature of the new US administration and its level of engagement in the Middle East and all the questions that that level of engagement uh, leads to. And third, insofar as NATO is concerned, given what is happening within the alliance in terms of reframing NATO's role to make it relevant to the challenges ahead, and that's the NATO 2030 process. So in that context, I'd like to make two or three remarks. First, um, the Middle East is not the area where NATO has been the most engaged, nor arguably the most successful over the last um, two decades at least. And there has always been a debate about the added value of the alliance in uh, the response to security challenges in the Middle East, be it in Iraq, uh, and of course also in Syria, let alone the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Linked to this, and second, there is the issue of how NATO could play a constructive role to compensate a partial US withdrawal from the region. 
during the Trump administration, we had the pleasure to hear about the NATO ME proposal, ME standing for Middle East. But more seriously today, the debate is still about how NATO can contribute to stability in Iraq through the reinforced uh, training mission, also in the Mediterranean and North Africa, where the US leadership is less obvious than it used to be. And finally, maybe more strategically, there is the question of how NATO will balance in the context of a forthcoming new strategic concept, collective defense with its project instability agenda. How will the new core tasks re reflect Will the new core tasks reflect the crisis management slash cooperative security agenda that is at play in the Middle East? How will partnerships, projecting stability, resilience, will all have a relevance for the Middle East be addressed so that NATO can continue to play a role in the broader region? So issues to be examined in this event. And once again, my thanks to Rosie, to Anise, and also on the NDC side to Chloe Berger for having put together this uh, event. I look forward to the discussion. And I think I hand over to Anise. Please, Anise. Thank you, Thierry. And uh, thank you, Neil, for kicking off the discussion today. Welcome, everyone. And thanks for joining our session on the change in Middle East and implication for NATO. I am uh, Anise Bastieri Tabrizzi. I am a senior research fellow at the International Security Studies Department at RUSI, where I also lead the Unpacking the MENA program. As Thierry mentioned, I'm also a non-resident associate fellow with the NATO Defense College. So I'm particularly pleased about uh, this collaboration between RUSI and uh, NATO Defense College. As uh, mentioned by Thierry, we have more joint events in the cards about which we'll share more details in due course, uh, but if you want to stay up to date with our activities at the Unpacking the MENA program, I do encourage you to sign up to our newsletter at rusi.org slash project slash unpacking hyphen MENA, or do follow us on Twitter at ISS underscore RUSI. So as mentioned before, the goal for today's discussion is really to look at what's going on in the Middle East, um, particularly identifying trends, challenges, and look at what can be done and by whom to increase the stability in the region. I'm delighted to be joined by four great experts who will help us cover a lot of ground. Uh, first, Maria Fantapie, who is a special advisor for the Middle East and North Africa region at the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. We also have Vali Nasr, who is professor of Middle Eastern Studies and International Affairs at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, also known as SAIS. Pierre Azou, who is an academic and research director at the Mediterranean Foundation of Strategic Studies. And last but definitely not least, my colleague, Michael Stevens, who is an associate fellow with us, but also a senior fellow at Globesight. Welcome to all of you and thanks for joining. I'll start by asking a few questions to our panelists and uh, encourage participants to already start writing your question in a Q&A box. I already see there are at least three questions, so, so well done. Uh, we want to make sure that this is a very informal conversation and also raise as many questions as possible from the participant to the panelist. Um, yeah. I will start with you. And uh, yeah, my question to you is really, what are what do you think are the major trends in terms of shifting alliances and flashpoints of confrontation in the region? If you can, you know, outline them in a very, very summarized way for us. Over to you, Pierre. You're muted. Still muted. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes, with pleasure, of course. Uh, could you please uh, share the first map I sent you, just very briefly, or uh, send me the the link to share my screen? I would like to share you and to share with you 
one map, uh, which I think uh, is far better than a lot of explanations. And do, do you have it? Yeah, I believe Emilia is working on sharing the map. OK. So let's say that, uh, to be very simplistic, there is currently going on uh, in the Middle East and the, in the Persian Gulf um, two different confrontations. One, I would say, two sort of new Cold Wars. One classical Cold War between the big players. Yes, thank you very much. Between the big player, which means uh, Russia, United States, and China. Uh, which is very pragmatic, rational, logic, previsible, and another Cold War, which is far less previsible and uh, very unpredictable, which is between the four main actors, regional actors of the area, namely Iran, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. And as you can see on the map, I would say that there are two uh, big zones of influence one in the north of this uh, red line uh, sharing the screen and sharing the map. So on the north, you have a big zone dominated clearly by Russia and Iran. And on the south, you have a big zone dominated by the US. And for these two big players, the role is, let's say, to maintain a certain level of tensions. <clears throat> Why? Uh, to be sure that uh, it will um, it will convince uh, the other uh, players to rely on these uh, big players as sponsor and arms providers, etc., and support in the Security Council, which means that the goal is maintaining a certain level of tension, but not too much to avoid to uh, escalate into a sort of uncontrollable war. Because in that case, it will, it will be a lose-lose option for everyone and for sure for Russia and for the United States. Then on the right side of the map, you have China. China is clearly in, the, in ambush. And uh, for the moment, they invest everywhere, both in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in Iraq, uh, in Oman, in the Emirates. And they are just awaiting to see how the settle, uh, how the, sorry, um, how the dust will settle uh, to be sure that uh, they will try to occupy any vacuum uh, in the region. So this is between the big player, very predictable rationale. But there is a second Cold War between the four main uh, regional actors, which, is, which could be dangerous. Why? Because it has a lot of uh, concern, uh, sorry, it has a lot of uh, relation to the internal uh, situation and to uh, the, the fate and to the survival of the regime. And clearly it's the case in Iran, uh, no matter to explain it's obvious, the same in Saudi Arabia with Mohammed bin Salman, the same is in, in Israel with Mr. Netanyahu, uh, which is clearly uh, a hoax, and the same in Turkey with Mr. Erdogan, which always try to push forward uh, a stance uh, below. And the complexity comes from the fact that if the big players have an interest to keep under control everything, these four regional actors, which mean Iran, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Turkey, could be tempted at one stage or another to escalate a bit more just to save their regime. And by the way, when you look at what is occurring now between uh, Israel and the Palestinian territory or between Israel and Iran in Syria and in Iraq. Uh, well, it looks like a bit the, the, what is, uh, it's a perfect illustration of that. Just to finish to say also that <clears throat> my view is that the next battlefield or at least uh, field of confrontation will be Iraq, which means that it's absolutely obvious that Iran is doing everything to expel uh, quietly but surely the Americans from Iraq. And this is, if they succeed in this, uh, in this objective, it will be a big uh, symbolic victory for them. So Iraq will be on the scope. Uh, I think that the Persian Gulf uh, paradoxically looks quite uh, sanctuarized, including with Mr. Biden, with the negotiation between uh, the US and Iran. And the field of tensions have moved so to Iraq, but also to, to Yemen still. 
but have moved to the Eastern Med and to the Red Sea. So the paradox is that when, let's say, one year ago, uh, it looked obvious that a war could erupt in the Persian Gulf. Now my uh, feeling is that the, the Persian Gulf is, paradox sorry, is paradoxically quite quiet, but uh, the, the Red Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean areas are the new uh, areas of confrontation. And I would Great. stop the first terms. Thank you very much, Pierre. I'm sure that we'll come back to several of the points that you raised, um, especially when it comes to specific theater of confrontation. Iraq is already one that is featuring high into the questions. Uh, but uh, looking again at the, the shifting alliances and trends of value, maybe I'll come to you. Uh, you recently wrote a piece arguing that the future of uh, the Middle East conflicts won't be between Iran and Arab states or Sunni versus Shia, but rather uh, it will be a result of competition between non-Arab powers, Turkey, Iran, and Israel. So can you tell us a little bit of what do you think uh, this will mean in practice and why do you think this is the ongoing trend? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, the main idea or message that I would like to, to convey is that uh, in the, let's say between for the last three decades, or between 1980 and 19 uh, and 2015, <clears throat> the main uh, chess game was between Iran and Saudi Arabia, or between Iran and the Gulf states. Uh, for many people, it's still the case. Uh, my guess is that progressively the chess game has moved from a competition between uh, Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia to between Iran and Israel. The chess game, the chess board is exactly the same. This is the Middle East. But because of the moves of every players, the party focus no, no longer on the Persian Gulf or let's say, yes, still a bit on Yemen, but I could explain on, the, on another map, but moved westwards toward the Mediterranean area, toward the Levant, and put into direct confrontation Iran and Israel. So of course it's a triangular game, classical triangular game between let's say Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, Israel, and then Turkey says, well, I'm the fourth guy and uh, I could play a role in this new game. This is how I see the, the, the thing. Thank you. Vali, um, yeah, maybe you can comment on this uh, since uh, you wrote uh, a recent piece on, uh, on this shifting alliance uh, as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Rusi for inviting me and thank you, Anissa. Uh, you know, in many ways, uh, the, the, big, the biggest question here and also for NATO is this idea that the Biden administration has of deprioritizing the Middle East. And this is the third president in a row who has put his as task for American foreign policy that the United States wants to leave the region. Now, in reality, since the Arab Spring, the real big uh, Arab players, uh, you know, Iraq obviously had faltered in 2003. Now Syria has faltered, Egypt has faltered. In my opinion, Saudi Arabia and UAE are not really big strategic players in the region. And I think to some extent, this idea of Iran-Saudi uh, rivalry is, is more of an imagination in Washington and in the West and it's a reality on the ground. Saudi Arabia is not present in Syria, is not present in Libya has failed in Yemen, is not a military threat, is not capable of leading diplomatic, political, or military decisions in the region. The fate of this region, the fate of Syria, uh, uh, you know, is, for instance, and the Levant, even Iraq, is being written by non-Arab actors, Russia, Turkey, Israel, and Iran. Saudi Arabia and UAE are really big players on the back of the United States. So, so long as you have an Iran-US competition uh, and, and potential war, as we saw during the Trump administration, the issue of Saudi Arabia, UAE became important. Now with the US in increasingly a smaller player, we're seeing that these non-Arab actors, Iran, Israel, and, and Turkey are asserting a greater deal influence. And, 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 and the Arabs essentially are trying to find a way in which to maneuver this. UA decided to throw its lot in with, with uh, Israel uh, in the Abraham Accords. Saudi Arabia is now actually trying to play much more of a role of a balancer. It's uh, warming up relations with both uh, uh, Turkey and Iran. 
And I think the, the uh, two issues are uh, critical here. One is um, uh, that uh, uh, the co what's happening in Israel-Palestine today is going to complicate this picture. Uh, it's going to complicate the Abraham Accords. It's going to give much greater uh, a room to maneuver to Tehran and Ankara in, in Arab politics. And I think as far as NATO is concerned, I think the big two, two, two countries matter here to think about. One is obviously Turkey. It's a NATO member. If Turkey is going to be a very big player in the Middle East, it's going to be meddling in, in Libya. It's going to be meddling in Syria. It's carrying out attacks in, in, in Iraq. It's pushing into Lebanon. It said it wants a role in Yemen. That ultimately is an issue for NATO. Uh, what does it mean? What does it mean if Turkey gets into, as, uh, as Pierre said, into some kind of a confrontation going down that path? And the second one is obviously the Russian role. Russia is a big target of NATO, and, and, and Russia's presence in the region is, is a, is a, a, critical, uh, a critical factor. So I, I think that the, 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 the big shift I would be saying is that since the 1950s, we've thought the Arabs really matter to the region. They're the deciding factor. Everybody else balances them. We're in a period where Arabs, the Arab world is where everybody else is, the main powers are fighting uh, uh, their, their, their big game. It's like there's a great power rivalry that is happening on the back of the Arabs. And if the US continues to reduce its footprint, and as Pierre says, it begins to even reduce its footprint in in Iraq, I don't see Saudi Arabia and UAE being able to maintain a strong strategic position on their own. They just don't, despite all the military expenditure, they're not capable of projecting force and, and deciding the outcome in places like Syria uh, uh, and in Iraq. Thank you very much, Vali. Again, I'm sure we'll come back to, to many of these points. Mike, I'll, I'll bring you in in a second on uh, bringing the Arab perspective, but uh, before, I wanted to check with uh, Maria about the implicate the other implication, if you wish, of the U.S. retention. Uh, Bali has uh, outlined one of the implication, which is you know potentially a shifting alliance, but also you know shifting balance of power, if you wish, in terms of uh, uh, which countries are more likely to dominate the region. But one other way to look at it is that it seems that countries such as the U.S., but also the U.K. in the latest uh, integrative review really want to ensure a more self-reliant region when it comes to security, uh, investing on capacity building, and, you know, NATO, the NATO mission in Iraq is just one example of, uh, you know, a, a mission that is very much focused on advisory training, capacity building, the goal of which is strengthening Iraqi security forces, but uh, in a way, the goal being to prevent the return of uh, Daesh and ISIS. So I guess uh, my question is, this attempt to have a more self-reliant and a more investment on capacity building uh, as, a, as a way to uh, retrench from the region, is this a winning strategy to ensure lasting stability in the region? Or do you think that so much, there's so much fear security vacuum that is uh, feared you know, as a consequence of the U.S. retrenchment is instead more likely. Maria, over to you. Thank you, Anise, and thank you for Rusi and the NATO Defense College for this uh, kind invitation. Um, uh, well, uh, I will start from what uh, Bali said last, that this uh, is the third administration that uh, tries to define what light footprints of the U.S. in the Middle East is. The previous two administrations have obviously uh, not succeeded in defining what light footprints of the U.S. in the Middle East is. Uh, with the catastrophic consequences which have been apparent uh, um, everywhere. But, uh, uh, and I do think that this uh, issue of the responsible retrenchment uh, uh, and the definition of what light footprints in the Middle East is really the key challenge of uh, this uh, administration. Uh, to come to your question regarding uh, the investment on, uh, on capacity building, well, I do think that with the, uh, the like the attempt to define these light footprints, for example, um, 
in the strategic areas like uh, uh, in the uh, across Iraq and Syria, we see that there are opportunities coming from NATO uh, for NATO. Um, one being uh, that one of uh, that once the U.S. Um, sort of tries to keep its military presence lighter, because this administration also decides or seems to signal that a lighter military presence is also a way to signal de-escalation with Iran in hot context like Iraq, uh, then uh, you uh, you can actually keep some what we call enablers, so light military presence, but then you can delegate some of the SSR activities to multilateral platforms, one being uh, NATO. Um, however, um, uh, really coming just uh, out from uh, Baghdad Yesterday, I can uh, certainly say that this uh, uh, transfer of responsibility is not easy. NATO is still um, uh, strongly dependent on the course of U.S. policy and also in the region is still very much perceived as a, a U.S.-led actor, a multilateral actor. Therefore, there is an opportunity of delegation to NATO, but under certain condition, one is good strategic communication that outlines that NATO is not exactly the same thing as the U.S. <laughs> Secondly, also continuous the escalatory zone from the U.S. And thirdly, also the issue of having maybe European countries, non-U.S. actors or non-U.S. actors on the lead of these missions. Um, and I think that unfortunately, this, uh, um, uh, this uh, sort of uh, conditions have not exactly been respected in Iraq, where now, unfortunately, the expansion of NATO, as it has been communicated, has been perceived by uh, local actors that are close to the Iranians as a danger, as a threat, and as a as synonymous of expanded also U.S. military presence. So there is a lot of work to be uh, done in order to uh, manage this uh, this this um, uh, this uh, this transfer of responsibility in a way in which really NATO can play a positive role and contract constructive role and help also the U.S. in the defining what light footprint uh, means. Um, on the second note, very quickly on the issue of Turkey, because I do think that the key challenges are really Iran and Turkey in some way, and how also the US will redefine that relations with these two players and how NATO will fit in within. We have a, I, I just said about the Iran issue on the one hand on Turkey, even on Turkey, you have on the one hand, um, NATO, it can be an opportunity in terms of like framing um, uh, Turkish actions in a hot uh, sort of uh, arena of context, but uh, uh, more likely we see that actually NATO participates to important NATO missions like in Iraq, but at the same time still conducts unilateral operations in Iraq and Syria. And actually by doing so, it actually undermines the NATO strategic relevance and weight. So I think that uh, again, there are over there opportunities, but also a lot of challenges ahead, and specifically in the relation between defining light, U.S. light footprints and relation between uh, Iran and Turkey and how um, actually uh, NATO will fit in with them. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Mike, uh, we already touched on uh, the Gulf countries, um, their uh, positioning in the region, but Obviously, putting into the context of the U.S. retrenchment, I think it's very important as looking at the Gulf countries and how they are seeing uh, this new scenario. Uh, I think, obviously, already from the Abqaiq attack, there has been a change in perception towards the fact that the U.S. was not going to be the, the security guarantor that it was in the past. But I think now the prospects of a longer-term retrenchment and you know more significant one uh, is uh, uh, possibly increasing the threat perception in the Gulf countries. So, so I guess my question to you is, how are the Gulf countries going to deal uh, with this security threat? Um, and, you know, basically my question is, are they going to be looking for another security guarantor, which is external, say, NATO-like? Or are we more likely to see attempts at more regional level of de-escalation either bilaterals or you know something a little bit more comprehensive you know the abraham accords obviously come into the picture but also the meetings which have been mentioned by pierre and uh, valley 
on a bilateral level, I think all of these, you know, come to mind. Mike, over to you. Yeah, there's um there's a lot to unpack there. Um, look, that there's a fundamental sort of fact here, which is that if you look at the Arabian Peninsula in general, it's been highly insecure now since the early 90s. So these countries have dealt with a level of insecurity for basically 30 years um, that none of them have been able to solve. Now, what you saw in 2011 to 2014 was an attempt by small states like Qatar and the UAE to go into other countries and shape their political preferences to try and get what they defined as security by effectively sponsoring people that looked a bit like them and thought a bit like them, um, which caused even more problems than solved. So one of the issues that you have actually is that the Gulf does not have a unified vision of what looks like security. What looks like security to Qatar, it's not the same as what looks like security to Saudi Arabia. Not only that, Saudi Arabia is just a much bigger place. It has global visions as to how it projects its power. And it thinks about the region stretching all the way across from Morocco into, into Southeast Asia. These are spheres of its influence. Qatar is a bit more transactional. The UAE is trying to present itself as something completely different now, as a kind of business and technological hub. Um, in the work I do now, the UAE is trying to present itself as this center of innovation and healthcare to basically say, hang on, we're not Saudi Arabia. We're not Qatar. We're something else. And therefore, we deserve your attention, China. We deserve your attention, United States. We deserve your attention, Russia. And if we have to de-escalate with the Iranians, then we will de-escalate with the Iranians. That's not really the position that the Saudis have. The Saudis are still locked into what you might call a kind of old school way of looking at security. They need the Americans. They know they need the Americans. And their options to go to China or to go to Russia for security are not real options. Mr. Erdogan has found that one out to his cost. That is definitely even more so the case with, with the Saudis. And so their strategic kind of flip-flopping in public is not replicated by what they're doing in private, which is they want a consistently engaged US. They don't want the US to leave the region. They understand that it is, that their interests are maybe not aligning perfectly. And I think they're also aware enough to understand that their leadership is not particularly popular in Washington. So there are many facets to this, but all in all, Qatar, UAE, Saudi, let's call them the sort of three biggest actors, are all in their own ways trying to keep the US involved because they can't imagine an environment where it doesn't exist, where it's not the primary security actor. Now you have the French, of course, who work particularly in the naval sphere in Abu Dhabi, but also on the west coast of Saudi. And you have the Brits who are very active in the air, in the air sector and who have a lot of, um, uh, how should we say, or a consistent history of defense sales in, in the air platform area and are quite influential there. The, the problem is, is that those three countries, the US, the UK and the French, don't actually agree either on what security should look like at the broader level. So what you saw after the escalation of tensions with the Iranians was this kind of French-led maritime mission versus the US-UK maritime mission, which was then even more kind of affected by the fact that there was a Brexit debate going on in the background. So there was no universal conception as to what security would look like, how that would then transfer onto bigger strategic questions like, for example, the nuclear deal. So it's a bit of a mess. I, I think I agree with Valley's point that the Arab states in the Gulf have tried to project power and largely have been unsuccessful. And so what they've done is that in the absence of what they would call a stable regional order, they have tried to de-escalate with Iran. They've opened bridges back to the Iraqis. They're talking to Bashar al-Assad now. Uh, and of course, you've seen the biggest one of all, which is the, the realignment with the Israelis. So they are going their own way to seek stability at the political level. At the strategic level, I still think it's the same question, but it's not clear as to how that will move forward other than they look to the US for some kind of support. Could NATO play a role? Yes, if NATO's talking about things 30 years out in the future, right? And I think that is where NATO needs to step up and talk about long-term security guarantees. There's, there's an additional aspect to this. The Gulf states are starting to play around in the Mediterranean in ways that they didn't. So you're starting to see United Arab Emirates doing training and air force exercises with Greece. You're seeing the same thing now with the Saudis which is pitching them in this weird tension between two NATO allies, where it's quite clear that certain 
aspects of golf politics align with, let's say, the French and Greek view of the Mediterranean. And then you've got the Qataris who, let's be honest, agree with the Turkish view of the Mediterranean. And so when you're then talking about NATO, you've got to kind of decide, well, okay, well, on, on what side are some of these players coming down on? And do they agree about a unified position for NATO? I don't wish to be harsh about the Gulf states, but I don't think they fully understand what NATO does, what it's there to do and what it's there to achieve. What they see are states who are clashing with one another and they see their interests as aligned with Mr. Macron or with uh, the Greek government. And so they take those, those steps. That is then amplified by what the Israelis and the Cypriots are doing. So you've got about eight different layers to this, all of which can be broken apart into very, very narrow self-interest. And it then makes it even more complicated to solve. What I think I'll sum up by saying is there's just a lack of a strategic vision from any of these three Arab countries as to what their ideal scenario would be when it came to security. Thanks, Mike, very useful. Uh, I raised one question that has been uh, written in the Q&A box so to both you and uh, Vali, um, which builds on very much on this point, uh, especially on the fact that the Saudi Arabia and the Emirates have been unable to wield much influence. Um, the question is, what do you think this means for the GCC? Might the Gulf Arab states try to reinvigorate it as a body to give them greater influence with the less prominent US role? Yeah, Mike, go ahead and then uh, I'll ask that. I'll answer that. OK. Um, so I wrote a piece fairly recently about why I think the GCC will survive this despite the severity of the split between Qatar and its neighbors, which was basically that the GCC never had any rules that governed how it should exist. So when Qatar was said to have broken the rules, everybody went back to the rule book and found that there was no rule to break. So it was actually quite easy to then bring it all back together again and say, well, we've fixed the problem because all the leaders at the top of me went, well, we don't consider Qatar a problem anymore. They did, but in the outs, sort of in the public face, they said they didn't. So the problem became fixed. Now, what I think is very obvious is that the Qataris since 2017 have been very clear that engagement with Iraq of their security doctrine, that is just a permanent feature of the landscape. Now, they're not going to walk back from having that plan B. And that's very simple. It's because their gas tankers have to go out through Iranian waters. So that will always be there. They will always have to play that balancing act. Oman does the same, and, and to some extent, the Kuwaitis are doing that. You had a scenario after Soleimani was, was uh, killed where Saudi Arabia was the only country engaging Iran. Now Saudi Arabia is engaging Iran. So you actually have more space to build what you might call a unified GCC framework for security. There are two aspects I think people have forgotten. One is that the Peninsula Shield Force kept training together despite the rift between Qatar and its neighbors, right? So you still had Qataris and Emirates together in a force which I agree is not a particularly strategically effective force, but nevertheless, they were still doing it. Two, you, you have a general consensus that breaking the GCC is more costly than trying to maintain it, even if you don't like one another. So you have these frameworks which exist. At the end of the day, the reason they were set up in the in the early 80s because of Iran is not really the reason they exist today. The Americans have tried for the last 20 years to give the GCC a reason to exist, to create frameworks within it that make it more solid as an institution. It's not really worked. So the question I guess is, should the GCC be the formula or the platform for an increased Gulf strategic foothold in the world? No, I don't think so. It should be there. It should be there for political coordination and just so that these six countries keep talking. But I think there are other frameworks and we can explore that, I think, in the process of this call. Thanks, Mike. Value. Yeah, I, I think Mike raises important issues uh, about GCC. Uh, yeah, I mean, and also certain things have happened which are important. One is that the split with Qatar was actually quite serious. It was really, it came close to a, a Saudi invasion of, of Qatar. It's really, it was about regime change in Qatar, the implications 
was for uh, at least Kuwait, Qatar, and Oman, uh, a sense that, uh, uh, that unless they became Bahrain in a sense of being uh, subservient to, to Riyadh and Abu Dhabi, that, that, that they could be under pressure. And they actually looked uh, to, for strategic support to Iran and Turkey uh, in order to uh, balance their allies within GCC. And even though there has been kind of a, uh, a softening between Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Qatar and UAE, the, the fundamental issues have not gone away. In other words, uh, uh, the, uh, Qatar and to some extent Kuwait and and uh, and Oman still would would look to uh, I- I- Iran and, um, uh, uh, and and Turkey as a way in which to make sure that they don't end up where they did uh, um, uh, with uh, with, the, uh, with the original split. So, as Mike says, this really puts the question that does does GCC really have legs to go beyond? Uh, uh, being just a, pl- a sort of a legacy platform uh, for the region. The second issue, and actually I have to say, for instance, uh, even as we're talking, Saudi Arabia wants to have bilateral engagement with Iran. Uh, the other members of GCC, particularly Kuwait, Qatar, and Oman, want the engagement with Iran to be through GCC. And so we had the Iranian foreign minister specifically going after Iraq to those three countries as a way of trying to sort of give them comfort that they're not gonna sell them out and just deal with uh, Saudi Arabia directly. The second issue is if there is a positive engagement as as Michael said between uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Iraq and Iran, uh, you know, what does really GCC stand for then? If it's not an anti-Iranian force that was created uh, originally in order to contain Iran. And if particularly the United States and Iran also end up uh, diffusing tensions, the, the, the real question is, you know, what is GCC formed against? And, and, and uh, yeah, there's all kinds of questions like the Iranians put on the table. Why shouldn't we have GCC plus two? In other words, a kind of Gulf security arrangement that can start with things like mine sweeping and maritime security and then sort of build up from there. And then the, 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 the third uh, point is GCC sort of backbone was the United States presence in the form of bases and, and, uh, and also uh, just generally the United States being the main force to contain Iran, contain Saddam, kick it out of Kuwait, you know, make, do all of those things. Now, I'm not saying that the U.S. is going to be departing anytime soon, uh, like giving up the base in Qatar or uh, uh, the the bases in Bahrain. But the notion of a lessening American military commitment to the Persian Gulf, especially as Pierre says, if if Washington comes to the conclusion that even within the Middle East, the Gulf is is fairly stable, then, uh, you know, fundamentally, the question is, what is GCC without without the US. And, and I do think there are interesting uh, dimensions. UAE has a go it alone policy here. It, it really wants, this little Sparta wants to become a big Sparta, wants to you know, uh, use Aden and, and islands to become a, 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 a blue ocean naval power in the Indian Ocean. It wants to set up shop in the Horn of Africa, you know, have control over Sudan, over Libya. Uh, so, so UAE's military ambitions are far beyond containment of Iran or far beyond confinements of GCC. And so if you have this kind of a different strategic vision within the Gulf, then, you know, uh, uh, potentially, as I said, we have to have very modest views of what GCC represents. And, and uh, it, it kind of is becoming like Arab League. In other words, somewhere where people may meet, but you know that's not where that's not where major decisions are made. Thanks, Vali. Uh, Maria, I have several questions for you on Iraq, uh, but before that, maybe you wanted to say a couple of words on the uh, Arab war as well. Thank you, uh, Anise. Well, I would just like to nuance a bit uh, the discussion on the um, on the GCC. I think that uh, I think that I agree that uh, this could be like a legacy platform that is mobilized just when it's needed, but is not necessarily strategically relevant. 
But I would also like to highlight that keeping the, um, uh, the, the Arab countries' engagement plugged in, it's a key to the stability in, of the region. So I uh, would nuance a bit the idea that is, uh, yeah, these challenges and the powerful countries are definitely non-Arab, but uh, um, uh, sort of like uh, trying to direct um, uh, Saudi Arabia actions towards the right course of actions, I think that uh, it's a key for also uh, NATO stability. Uh, either through the GCC or, or through uh, bilateral engagement. Now we see quite important signs of uh, KSA trying to do a bit of the Emirati games and trying to bridge in within the Levant um, into platforms that were uh, usually just the strict domain of the Iranians. Uh, KSA trying to partner and befriend uh, Shia Arabs in Iraq this is something that is happening and it was already happening since quite a long time, I mean, since a couple of years, but now it's happening even more. And I think that the rapprochement in Syria, the normalization uh, in Syria with, with the regime and other um, uh, potential alliance uh, of uh, KSA within the Lebanese environment, so with, which is, are not with Shia actually, with the, sorry, not with Sunni groups, are very interesting because you see a potential partnership of, uh, KS, of, of Saudis trying to befriend non-Sunnis within the region. And I think this is not an irrelevant uh, um, uh, move uh, in an attempt, of, of course, of uh, edging uh, in, in front of the, the Iranians. It's an attempt of edging in front of the Iranians once the US are felt as less of a military umbrella under which they can rely. So they are trying to, in some way, play a game, not through the GCC multilateral platform, but through potential exploring different avenues. The destiny of these attempts are, is not yet clear whether they succeed, but they shouldn't, I think, uh, also be, uh, uh, you know, considered. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Maria. Uh, so on Iraq and here, uh, everyone who wants to chip in, please do. But uh, there are a few questions specifically uh, raised on this uh, one from Chloe Berger. Uh, it's uh, what condition do you think Iraqi, at what condition do you think Iraqi local actors close to Iran could accept NATO, if at all? Uh, and uh, there is another one on the elections in October and the chances of uh, Kadimi's government uh, to return to office and how NATO's presence in the country uh, will change if the electoral outcome is unfavorable uh, to Kadimi. And finally, security sector reform. This is from Paolo Napolitano. Uh, and uh, the fact that this is highly politicized uh, with multiple stakeholders. And uh, basically, what can NATO do to make sure that it's going to be successful? How is NATO going to be, be able to deal with this? Maria, I'll give the floor to you, but anyone who wants to chip in, please do. Maria, I, you are not muted, but we cannot hear you for some reason. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Just a second. Okay, you can hear me now. Yeah. So what, uh, these are all very legitimate questions. And I think that the issue of uh, uh, creating a, 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 a an adequate and friendly uh, platform in Iraq to have uh, uh, to have the NATO mission is now a challenge because of uh, after uh, the assassination of, of Suleimani Abu, Abu Mahdi al muhandis already there was a sort of hardening of the uh, Shia politicians position towards any foreign uh, military presence uh, but I think that uh, uh, I will just quote uh, passages of a conversation I had just two days ago in Baghdad saying well uh, I mean until one year ago we didn't even know that NATO had a mission and now uh, with the recent uh, uh, declarations of the um, Secretary General, which 
made the announcement that the mission will be enlarged up to 4,000. Uh, this was on the discussion of any single Shia group. So I think that this was a big strategic mistake, uh, the announcement of the increase of, of military presence, which was totally, let's say, misplaced because it actually in, um, uh, triggered some sensitivities that were not there before. And this is why I said that strategic communication is, is very important. Definitely the, um, um, and, and the, the, like the quite paradoxical situation is that now, actually with the JCPOA uh, discussions and also the, 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 the Vienna talks, um, we see that uh, on the one hand, uh, there has been also, there could have been actually uh, some space to negotiate a sort of US-Iran coexistence within Iraq. But you also have a big problem of these paramilitary groups who have their own agency, uh, who uh, of course, uh, out of their uh, keeping their own legitimacy, they need to have uh, an enemy. And once, you know, <laughs> once there is such a declaration of an increase on, of troops, it's very difficult actually uh, for the government to um, to make uh, this uh, to actually let this uh, this happen in such numbers, so um, I would say that uh, now the situation for NATO uh, an, in an increased NATO mission in Iraq it's very challenging, and uh, the worst case scenario is to have a situation where NATO um, bank and bet all its cards on an expanded mission, also for its future strategic planning, and then Iraq does not have actually those conditions that would allow. Uh, an expanded mission. On the contrary, an expanded mission will create internal tension that will actually make uh, backfire on the gains that we made thanks to this de-escalatory policy of this US administration and the advancements of the JCPOA talks. So uh, I think that here it's uh, to keep in mind the no harm effect. And um, as for the prime minister, the prime minister in, in Iraq is, uh, as the position, is the weakest man or you know, was always the man uh, in the country, it's not the strongest. So it's not about having the right person or it's not only about having the right powerful person, it's about how he comes into power and what kind of, uh, uh, we say in Arabic, tawafukia, what kind of agreements there are behind him. Usually those agreements happen within the Shia party. So it's very important not to bet only on him as such, but to really create an environment that would allow him and other uh, reformist allies within the Iraqi political system to continue um, engage the international community, including NATO. Thank you very much, Maria. Pierre. I know you wanted to comment on this and I have a couple of questions for you as well. So do start with Iraq and then we'll move forward. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Anise. Uh, very quickly, I agree with uh, Maria on that point. Uh, and to answer to uh, Chloe Berger's question, uh, my guess is that the Shia, neither the Shia militia nor ISIS will ever accept uh, an increased presence of uh, NATO, uh, of the NATO mission training in Iraq. Why? Because I see NATO as a pure tool of the US and the strategic goal, their strategic goal is to expel the US from Iraq. And uh, due to the coming uh, presidential election in, uh, on the 18th of June uh, in Iran, uh, which will be certainly win or won uh, by the very conservative party, even perhaps by the Pazdaran, uh, there is a few, very few guess and chances uh, to find a sort of deal uh, between, uh, I would say, Iran uh, and Iraqi government and the US uh, on that presence. So this is for one point. To answer another Chloe, Chloe Berger's question about the red line and the risk of escalation in the Gulf, who could, uh, let's say, uh, <clears throat> uh, who could help to uh, respect such sort of red lines in the Gulf? Uh, my answer is China paradoxically. Why, uh, why the situation has been sanctuarized in the Persian Gulf in the, in the past, let's say, five, six months? This is not only because of the election of Joe Biden. This is because China, at the top level, said, we need the Strait of Hormuz and the Gulf of Oman as a free and peaceful area to provide us energy on the long term. And we will do everything to ensure that there will be neither no blockers, no military action in that area, et cetera. So the Chinese are increasing the pressure, 
not only, uh, and by the way, uh, both uh, on the Emirates, on Saudi Arabia, on Israel, and on Iran. And as you have seen, probably, there was a strategic deal um, uh, concluded between Iran and China uh, two months ago, uh, which is quite promising. And clearly the goal, because uh, these deals have been, uh, have been made with Oman, with uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, is peace, be quiet in the area, and everything will be fine. This is why, by the way, uh, the US has, uh, I would say, with Mr. Biden, reinvested the area and the, peninsula, and the Arabic Peninsula. My guess is it's not at all uh, against Iran or against Russia. It's on the very long run uh, against China to be sure that in the big confrontation in the coming 20 years or 30 years, uh, including in the sort of uh, big economical war, if, if needed, uh, the United States will be able to close uh, the roads of energy to China by controlling the Strait of Hormuz, Oman, the Emirates, and the Strait of Bab el-Mandeb. So uh, on, the one side, on the one hand, sorry, it could be good news for the, for the Gulf states because it's a way that the US are coming again uh, in the area, but not for the same reasons as in the past, which means containing Iran, containing Russia, etc., but mostly on containing China, China coming both from Iran, from the Indian Ocean. And, I, and, and by the way, uh, also with the GCC um, question, um, perhaps that it could be interesting to see what, what are the views of Beijing uh, on the GCC. Because uh, if Beijing or if uh, China considers uh, the GCC as a useful tool to project its influence in the Gulf, Perhaps they, 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 they will do a lot of things to, let's say, help to survive the, the body and uh, coordinate the body, but it's just a personal feeling. And I answer to your other questions. Yes, thanks, Pierre. Very comprehensive. Vali, uh, I know you have a two finger on Iraq, but I also wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit on uh, Turkey Iran relations, uh, since uh, there is a question in the chat about. Uh, uh, you know, implication, broader implication for the rest of the region as well. So, so on Iraq, uh, uh, I just, I, and, and Maria may have a view on this. Uh, you know, I, I know that, uh, you know, the Iraqi economy is a concern to Iran. And, uh, and if uh, uh, there have been all kinds of reports that it's struggling and come this summer, it may actually falter. And I don't think uh, the Iranians would benefit from a, a from, a sort of a major crisis point uh, in Iraq for varieties of reasons, including their own equities, including uh, 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 also the funding that the guards, revolutionary guards and other, other groups get out of Iraq to have a mayhem situation. I, I think, you know, that Iraq is somewhat for Iran is tied to JCPOA. Uh, if there is positive movement there, then I think the scenario in which uh, uh, there could be an Iraqi-Iranian conversation about a minimum security is along the lines that Pierre mentioned. In other words, if Iranians would be cooperative if it helps the United States to leave voluntarily. If, on the other hand, the U.S. wants to increase its presence, and NATO and U.S. here is interchangeable, lar largely in terms of terminology, then I don't see a, a, a deal. But any kind of a U.S. departure from Iraq would have to do with success in Vienna, because otherwise it just, I don't think you could fail in Vienna and have a positive conversation uh, 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 on Iraq. The, the, on, on Turkey and Iran, you know, Turkey in many ways, whether you talk to Israeli analysts or Iranian analysts or others, is the most unpredictable actor in the region. Right, uh, the Iranians know what Israelis would do. Israelis know what Iranians would do, but you don't know what side of the bed Erdogan is going to get up in the morning. That uh, and 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 the way in which he uh, aggressively went into uh, Azerbaijan in order to decide uh, uh, the outcome of the war and particularly the military hardware that he used, the the, the current aggressive posture in northern Iraq. Uh, or, or basically pushing against boundary lines that had, you could say previously, were kind of uh, unspoken gentlemen's agreements between Tehran and, and Ankara. And, and Turkey is getting much more into areas that Iranians may have viewed as their sphere, for instance, into 
into northern Lebanon. They're, they're trying to fill in this Saudi vacuum, build the networks of Sunni leaders in Tripoli and, 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 and in, in the north. And then on the other hand, uh, like, like the declaration that they are interested in Yemen. I don't know why in their right mind anybody wants to get into Yemen at this point, but 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 they do. And, 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 I, and I think uh, the language that we've seen in the past number of months between Iran and Turkey era, era, about northern Iraq is 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 quite tense. Uh, in in and uh, it potentially suggests that despite the fact that on Qatar or on Israel issues or on Hamas, uh, they they have certain agreements uh, that that there are that that the areas in which they're going to be uh, potentially get into each other's. Uh, here is going to be more problematic. The, the one thing that may keep Erdogan's hand is, again, if there is success in Vienna, Turkey, particularly given the state of its economy, will look to be a bridge for trade with Iran, as much as little trade as they might be. In other words, Iranian oil and gas, as in before going through Turkey uh, or vice versa, goods coming into Iran. And, and for that, uh, that might play a tempering role. But, but, but I think generally, and this is again an important issue for NATO, Turkey is a major disruptor in the region. And it's the one force that is actually on, on an expansionist mode beyond what we've been used to. And so it's, it's hitting against Israel, it's hitting against Arab interests, but inevitably it's also hitting against, against Iranian interests as well. Thanks, Vali. And uh, continuing on the Turkey trend, uh, Mike, there is a question about Turkey Emirate relations. Um, I think relations, it's, it's uh, too optimistic, uh, probably confrontation and again, uh, implications for the region. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit on that and explain what you think are the implications? Sure. Well, I don't think it's any great secret guy on many, many different things. Um, I also think, though, that it is um, mostly overlooked that the largest bilateral trade partner in the Gulf with Turkey is UAE. It's not Qatar, despite the fact that when you go to Ankara or Istanbul, you see lots of QNB, Qatar national tanks everywhere, right? And there's been a lot of um, noise made about the Qatar with, um, with Turkey over the last five, six years. Uh, including the military base. Now, clearly, the Emirates are extremely uncomfortable with Turkish power projection into the Gulf, but their messaging on that has been really very inconsistent. Indeed. What you had were uh, ministers like Anwar Gargash coming out and saying things like, the Turks are a threat to our national security and our national interests. Well, they weren't saying that when the base was first established and when their bilateral trade with Turkey far outstripped that of Qatar, right? So the principle is not necessarily that they are against Turkish presence in the Gulf, they're against Turkish ideological expansionism. And that's what they seem to be fighting, these military uh, training going on with Greece and partly why you have the Abraham. Um, why you have competition in the Horn of Africa, particularly Somalia, um, Somali land, and also some efforts in Sudan and Ethiopia as well. And of course, the big one is Libya, where they just don't see eye to eye. And I think it's fair to say that um, Turkey and uh, the Emiratis were quite happy to fight till the last Libyan uh, to see their strategic goals realized. Do I think that there is room for compromise? Yes, I do, simply because I think that Turkey is too important to be ignored. And I think that the UAE is too important to be ignored for either side, right? So there is room for compromise, provided that the ideological heat between the way that they see the world calms down. Now, that is the variable that you just can't. We've lost Mike. Just Mike, sorry, no. your connection is not too good. Do you want to turn off your camera? Okay. Sorry about that. Sure. Is, is that a bit better? Yes, yeah, fine, better. Fine. Thanks. So I'll be very quick and I'll be very quick in that case. So the issue is complicated by things like what has happened between Hamas and 
Israel, where you have the Turks quite clearly coming out in a very strongly pro-Palestinian way, um, both rhetorically and in terms of engaging with Arab states, and the Emiratis who simply don't know what to say about this at all and are being outmaneuvered on the question quite significantly. Um, I, I think the ide ideological question is going to drag on for 20 years. Uh, in terms of practicalities, look, both sides have been suffering because of the coronavirus. Their economies are weaker than they would normally be. They need each other, so they will continue to engage. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Mike. But don't leave yet because I have a couple more questions for you specifically. One is about uh, uh, whether NATO should promote the expansion of its Istanbul Cooperation Initiative to include Oman and Saudi Arabia and whether this is a realistic uh, possibility. And then I have another one on the UK. Yeah, so I answered that question uh, on the chat function to your, uh, to your colleague there. Uh, yes, absolutely, it should. Um, the, the problem is getting those six states to define accurately what they expect from NATO. I think it should be done. I think that conversation has to happen because I think we need to, as complicated as it is, try to work out what each of the six Gulf states sees in common in terms of how they view NATO, what they view NATO as capable of doing, and therefore what they expect from it. They may all be different, but until you have that conversation through the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative and you get that process running again, you don't know. So as, as far as I'm concerned, it's a conversation that has to happen. Oman definitely needs to be brought in and Saudi Arabia is clearly the most important of the lot. To have them sitting outside of this uh, is not productive. So. Great. And on the UK, uh, one of the questions raises the fact that UK, the UK has a very strong naval presence in the region. Uh, it mentions Bahrain, the frigates are permanently based there, but also the presence uh, throughout missions uh, ranging from the north, uh, north of the Gulf uh, to the Horn of Africa. And the question is, is this now the primary Western military mission in the Gulf and isn't more generally maritime security an excellent mission for common regional and global security interests. And I ask actually this question to everyone else because maritime security is something that is often raised as a common denominator in terms of de-escalation in the region as well. Mike, over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, conscious I'm taking up a lot of people's time here. Uh, yes, look, the, the return to east of Suez or whatever it's been termed by, by the press, you know, that, that's been a plan that's been in the works since 2012. You know, the, the UK has significant presence in Dukum uh, and in Manama, of course, um, which has helped to build up a naval presence there. We intend to run a carrier at least once every six months through the area uh, that will involve us cooperating with other states. So the, the UK can't operate alone through this. Our minesweep of the capability is well understood. But again, you have a lot of French presence in the area as well. Um, there is a lot of cooperation between ourselves and the French, and especially between ourselves and the Americans. I still think the Americans are the most important player in the area. I think that the UK plays or second place in terms of its strategic footprint um, with the French, and they swap over depending on what issue you're talking about. Um, nevertheless, the backbone of the British engagement and the Gulf strategy as it was signed in 2015 was a military backbone which was then designed to give us commercial leverage, which would block out the Chinese, some countries in South Asia, and increase our economic leverage in the region through security guarantees. That was the plan. It didn't go to plan simply because one, you had, you had Brexit, two, you had the Qatari dispute, three, you then had differences between Trump and the Europeans. And so that strategic foothold has never really materialized in the way that the British hoped that it would. Nevertheless, they're still a significant player um, and maritime security missions were long thought to be the best way that you could bring the Iranians and the Gulf Arabs together to work on common problems, one being drug smuggling, right? So this was, you know, in 2013, 14, the one thing that we would always talk about was how could we get cooperation between the Gulf Arabs and the Iranians on illegal narcotics, 
uh, small arms trafficking and smuggling in general coming through Dubai, et cetera. And there was a lot of hope back then that that could be the framework that you could get both sides to engage through. Um, again, it's not really materialized in the way that those hopes uh, had, had sort of you know, foreseen. So there's a lot of work to do. It is a framework that I think has been constructive in terms of UK relationships with the Gulf. I'm not sure, and you know, we've got Pierre on the call here. I'm not sure it really affects the French position, and I don't think it really affects the American position. I think we think bilaterally in those terms. Um, nevertheless, yes, it is. It is good leverage for Britain, and you know, Theresa May in 2016 made it very clear that the vast bulk of this engagement was for our prosperity, which I think has been increased post COVID and, and post Brexit. Thanks, Mike. Maybe Pierre, do you want to come in on this uh, and also comment on uh, one question which uh, asks uh, whether maybe focusing too much on China, uh, we are risking overlooking the fact that Russia rather than China is trying to fill in the US and NATO military void in the region. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, the, the answer is where, which means that in Iraq, uh, and I think that Maria is far better suited to answer. But my my knowledge is that in uh, <clears throat> in Iraq, in Iraq the, the Russians are not not really welcome, and uh, not really well seen. So I don't think so. Uh, Syria, yes, of course, but uh, this is another part uh, of the game. In the Persian Gulf, uh, or in the Gulf states, uh, yes, the Russians could be welcomed. Why? Because on the ideological political agenda, they don't want to promote democracy at all. So they are fine with every leadership, as long as this leadership, uh, let's say, uh, buys weapons, uh, allow bases and allow uh, facilities, uh, and this sort of field. Uh, nevertheless, I guess that Russia will have some difficulties to, uh, let's say, to, to settle on the long run in the area. Yes, uh, they are opening a small base in Sudan. Yes, they dream to have a base in Yemen or in Socotra. Uh, yes, they would like to have a small base in Jordan or in Saudi Arabia. Uh, yes, they would, they would dream to have a base in Egypt. But I don't think that it's going to happen quickly uh, because there are a lot of uh, competitors. And I don't see the US uh, allowing um, these countries um, to create a situation where it could happen. When on China, I think that this is really the, the main competitor on the long run. So uh, China is just patiently patiently uh, awaiting to see how the situation will evolve. And then we'll try to go forward either uh, through uh, Iran, uh, Iraq, uh, Syria, Iran, Turkey, etc., etc., or even in the Gulf. And there is, uh, when I was in Tehran uh, and in the Gulf state, we had a lot of uh, fascinating discussion with Iranian authorities and Gulfies, uh, or Gulf authorities. And they all told us, that there was clearly an economical competition to catch the, the Chinese investment. And uh, well, of course, there is a, a lot of uh, geopolitical rivalries between them, but there is also economical uh, rivalries. This is my point. Thanks, Pierre. Very useful. Um, there are a few questions that uh, really focus on NATO here. Uh, so I'm going to raise them all together, uh, but uh, asking you all to, you know, provide your sense since, you know, this conversation was very much about uh, the Middle East uh, changes and uh, trends and dynamics, but also the role of NATO. And we touched on that, but there are still questions from uh, the participants. So I think it's, it's very useful to address them. So one is about whether there is a role for NATO in bringing security and stability to Yemen. I think I have the answer, but uh, I'll raise it anyway. Then there is one about what are the most compelling reasons for NATO engagement in the Middle East? Is it global competition, counterterrorism, energy security, or anything else? There is one on whether NATO should market itself as a security guarantor to Arab states. 
And uh, if it does not, uh, will Arab states look elsewhere? I think we touched on this partially, but again, like having a more clear answer for the participant would be good. And finally, but uh, not least importantly, how light or heavy should NATO footprint be in the Middle East? There is a question basically saying that uh, uh, Maghreb is a much more fertile ground for NATO in terms of uh, w uh, the role that it could play in confidence building between Algeria and Morocco, counterterrorism, migration flows, and so on and so forth. So I guess the uh, unintended question is, is there even a role for NATO in the Middle East? If at all, Maria, why don't I start with you and then I move to the rest of the group? Yes, actually, it's, it's difficult to answer this, all these questions, especially that um, the challenge in this discussion is always to bridge you know, the discussion within NATO with the discussion on the Middle East. And it's, uh, it's two platforms that are separate and it's challenging to to make to, to to create a bridge between the two i want to add something on the um, uh, issue of russia and uh, and china um i see uh, i mean this is uh, uh, an observation i see uh, that uh, russia is uh, looking with uh, a lot of uh, uh, concern to a, a potential, uh, um, uh, first of all, Russia does not perceive that the US is actually willing to withdraw from the Middle East. <laughs> so I think that this needs to be said, or at least this is my impression. Um, um, and in regard to the situation in the Levant, they also see that uh, um, they also are concerned about an entrenchment rather than a, a retrenchment of US presence uh, in north of Iraq and eastern Syria, which is will be both a military presence and a um, um, economic presence because of the oil fields. Uh, so basically, the entire uh, area of the border between Iraq and Syria that will become, uh, you know, an area of uh, of a few um, U.S. soldiers, but still an area of U.S. influence. And I think that one of the biggest challenges to understand that like considering the in, uh, important role that Russia has for the future of Syria is to understand whether there is any possibility to, um, uh, to work out a sort of coexistence between US and Russian interests precisely in this area, per perhaps with the predominant US role on the um, uh, US, uh, Iraq side and a remaining Russian role on the, on the, on the Syria side and the sort of uh, condominium in the Northeast. So this is an open question. As for the uh, role of Russia, uh, role oh, sorry, of NATO in the, in the region, well, um, honestly, I, I do think that in some situations, uh, uh, especially as we have just discussed on Iraq, the increased presence of NATO can just uh, add uh, fire to uh, flame, uh, fuel to fire <laughs> in terms of like creating um, an escalation there where there could be some poss possibility of, you know, of, uh, of, uh, of, of coexistence uh, to be renegotiated. Um, but again, it's also about uh, not uh, necessarily the, the, the presence itself, but also how you communicate your, your presence. Uh, so this is uh, this has uh, an important uh, an important role uh, an important role indeed. Uh, but I do think that uh, uh, there is a danger overall, which is that I see that the NATO is searching for its role, its new role, and there is a lot of discussion about this. And I think it should be very important that uh, NATO does not uh, um, actually fall into the the, into the mistake of just for the sake of giving itself a role to impose it, its presence in very um, uh, difficult scenarios, uh, political scenarios, because that could, uh, could actually uh, backfire. Thank you very much, Maria. Vali, uh, if I can come to you, and there is also a follow-up question on asking about Turkish military presence in Libya and whether there is an opening for NATO to play a more active role uh, in that sense. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that. I just thought to throw it out there just in case you want to build on, again, the NATO-related questions that I, uh, that I asked before. Uh, so I, I, I agree with Maria in the sense that uh, I, I think we're at right now the position where where NATO has to, particularly after the, the conversations that happened during the Trump years, has to 
figure out uh, what its mission forward is. And, and, and this is very much contingent on about the nature that transatlantic relations are going to take. And in the first hundred days, there's a lot of back and forth about, uh, you know, uh, what does America being back means in terms of transatlantic relations. And I think once that's sorted out, it's it's much easier to think about that. It's difficult for NATO to be to be sort of thinking about the Middle East being a, a new mission for it to to coalesce, uh, for reasons that Maria said that is particularly difficult and dangerous to to get into uh, conflicts that are so deep and and difficult and would demand enormous amount of resources uh, from NATO for it to be effective. Uh, and, and potentially might might not have public support, whether it's in the United States uh, or in Europe for those kinds of missions, and nor significant justification for why this is a this is a necessary uh, uh, mission. Secondly, uh, uh, I, I think you know timeline is a key issue. I mean, uh, uh, you know, th this administration's direction in terms of where it wants to go with the Middle East is not clear. It's being dragged into the Middle East, but it's not doesn't have a forward policy towards the region. I wish, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I could say, as Pierre has put down, that the Americans are really that forward thinking to be thinking about China that far ahead. Uh, I, I do think his points are well taken, but I just don't see in Washington that kind of uh, foresight, strategic thinking about uh, the, the Middle East. I mean, the, the idea for, for the U.S. is still that China is an East Asian power and they need to pick up and go to East Asia. They don't have a clear sense about, uh, you know, how, how do they manage uh, uh, the region. But having said that, there are, I think, other sorts of things NATO has to think. And I think here there is some degree of divergence between threat perception in the U.S. and Europe. Conflicts in the Middle East are more dangerous to Europe than they are to the US at some level. Yes, they can agree both on terrorism, but this is still a hotter issue, I think, for Europe, given its own large Muslim population and the way in which they got engaged in Syria and ISIS that it might be for the US, which is now currently focused on Mexico and, and migration and other sets of issues. And then the entire refugee migrant issue is 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 a is an imminent threat to Europe and could be a mission for NATO rather than, let's say, uh, uh, it is for the United States. And 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 I think if conflicts in the Middle East get out of control, I think uh, 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 that's that's something that NATO needs to needs to needs to think about. In other words, it's not the big picture issues, but it's really the, the consequences of the conflict that could bring bring NATO in. As far as Turkey is concerned, I think it's the same issue that Maria raised about Iraq. You know, Turkey is playing its own game, and and it's not going into Libya with, with any sense of uh, providing security for Libya that would benefit, let's say, Europe. That would close the migration uh, uh, hole that that Libya is now uh, providing for all of Africa into in, in, into Europe, and it's quite destabilizing. And 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 ultimately. Uh, Libya could become sort of a problem, uh, much uh, ongoing problem for the region that, that might require NATO's engagement to stop terrorism, to uh, stop migration. But, the, but NATO would have to go into, into Libya essentially uh, to contain and control and discipline one of its own members. Uh, 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 Turkey, and, and that sort of poses all kinds of all kinds of uh, 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 questions for, for NATO. Thank you, Ali. Um, all very, very good points uh, that you raised. I'm sure we could talk about several of these for much longer. Uh, Mike, do you want to have a go? And if you can just focus also, most importantly, about the question about whether NATO should market itself as a security guarantor to Arab states. I know we touched on this, but it would be good just to reiterate. Thanks. Um, there's certainly a space that NATO can play in and, and say that it has a role, that it thinks strategically, that it thinks long-term about the benefits of uh, mutual security guarantees in the region. Um, I think anything's better than the current situation that we have now. And I, I agreed with Pierre that you have this 
really quite worrying situation where the three big non-Arab powers um, are busy competing uh, over Arab territory for influence. And I think if there's no engagement, particularly from NATO with Arab powers, then it's it's always going to feel a bit disjointed. There's always going to be uh, Arab countries trying to push back against that type of pressure uh, and aligning with one of these big powers against the other, one of the big regional powers against the other. And so I think that there is, there's, there's two things that can happen here. One is reassurance, right? NATO needs to be playing a role which reassures states that their territorial integrity will be intact. That's a huge issue, right? In terms of, and we haven't really talked about this, but in terms of Arab pride, one of the reasons that there's so much frustration at the moment is because there are so many Arab states where sovereignty is contested, where they don't actually have all the tools that you might call, you know, or, or might be the sort of the barbarian monopoly on the use of force, right? It just doesn't exist. And there are just a list of countries where this is the case. Now, some of these Arab countries are part of that problem, but a lot of them can be part of the solution provided they're brought into a larger framework. The problem is, is that various actors within NATO have engaged on that front, but not everybody. And it's not only the US's job to solve. It can't be only the US. So I, I think broadly speaking, given that the Europeans are more concerned about Mediterranean security uh, than America is, then there absolutely has to be an E3 role there. Right. I've always felt that the E3 was a really, really important balance against U.S. interests, be they positive or negative. And whether that's played through the role of NATO or through another framework, I think that's an incredibly important thing to happen because it balances out voices on the nuclear program. It balances out voices on the Mediterranean. It balances out black and white views about you know, Sunni and Shia or Iranian interference here, there and everywhere. The same question goes with Israel and its power projection. So. What I said earlier before my, my camera went wonky uh, was that that conversation needs to be had. If you don't have that conversation, then we're not going to be able to understand what it is that these states are looking for. So to me, the engagement needs to start on the NATO side. Now, will the GCC countries know what that conversation should look like at the beginning? Probably not. So the running will have to be done in terms of setting the frameworks from the NATO side. But ultimately, if you don't have that I think we lost you, Mike, for the last bit, but I think your message was kind of delivered. <laughs> so thank you for that. Pierre, last word to you. Okay, very quickly. Uh, I agree with uh, Vali and Maria on uh, what they said on the last point. Uh, just to answer to the question to NATO and Yemen, I would say that uh, if you have enjoyed Afghanistan, you are going to love Yemen. Uh, and this is very clear. Uh, <clears throat> turning to uh, NATO in the Middle East. I think, uh, not I think, I'm sure. And I know that uh, the Middle East uh, countries and leadership, they are smart. So uh, they are uh, watching the fact that NATO currently is divided, uh, host a lot of frustration between different members with different visions going or watching uh, eastward, northward, southward. So the answer is how could a body which is not cohesive could bring uh, stability and security in a region like uh, the Middle East? So my guess is that first, be sure that NATO uh, becomes again a, a very cohesive and, uh, and uh, with a, let's say, cohesive partner with a real strategic vision. Uh, and then perhaps uh, it could bring some assistance to the Middle East, but definitely not in the in the current situation. Thank you very much, Pierre. And thank you really, all four of you, for covering so much ground in such a short time and in a very gracious manner, despite the fact that we tackle very complex issues. Uh, I wanted to echo once again uh, our thanks to NATO Defense College for partnering with us on this event. And uh, as mentioned before, we have more in the pipeline, so do stay tuned, do follow us on our newsletter and our Twitter handle. But for now, 